Thanks very much, Greg. And uh, I just uh, want to thank everyone for the invitation to be here tonight. Uh, I do have a microphone on, but that's for recording purposes. I'm, I'm used to doing public speaking, and I am, but I am going to check. You can hear me at the back. Is that all right? Great. Awesome. And if you don't, just heckle me and tell me to sort of speak up. Uh, so, yeah, a bit of a story to, to contextualise this. You know, what is an urban futurist and, and what do I do? So, I'm a town planner uh, by trade. I worked in state government uh, and local government, South Australian Parliament. I uh, was a principal planner at a, a big uh, fringe council called the City of Playford, named after Sir Thomas Playford, in an area that was actually Elizabeth, which was going to be a sort of a modern uh, town uh, on the edge of the City of Adelaide. Adelaide itself, of course, is a really interesting town planning exercise because it was a modern social experiment to balance land, capital and labour, uh, an act of Westminster uh, in the UK and a model, modern settlement. So um, Adelaide's got a great DNA of strategic planning. Uh, but in terms of then, I uh, got sick and tired of giving good advice to elected members I didn't necessarily thought understood the future issues and ran for council, became a councillor, uh, then became a deputy Lord Mayor and uh, about six years ago, uh, my incredible wife and I uh, decided to make a big leap. About the time of the GFC, my wife was pregnant, stuck 20 grand on my credit card, uh, knocked on every single door of the city, took me four or five months, I walked over 800 kilometres, ran a social media campaign to be elected as the Lord Mayor. So I'm not a member of any political party. I'm, in fact, a hardcore cities nerd who's really passionate about it and probably, I think, the only planner that's actually bothered to go and knock on every door talk to every business, talk to every resident, did every high-rise building and those sorts of things. Additionally, uh, I don't collect stamps or snow domes. Uh, I know where most international connections are and I've had the conversation about um, uh, Sunshine Coast Airport uh, and I'm uh, addicted to travel. So I've never been to Darwin. I've actually just uh, flown in from Darwin and I'm off to Auckland soon uh, and uh, work in the Middle East and been to Europe and uh, a whole pile of things. So I love cities. I don't necessarily own uh, knowledge on cities. I want to acknowledge there are lots of talented town planners in the room uh, and also I like to acknowledge that you are the international experts on the Sunshine Coast. I'm not here to tell you what to do uh, and I am going to cover two specific topics. So I've been asked to talk about two specific topics uh, that are related to the future of cities. One is going to be about placemaking and how that actually can change how a community thinks about itself and then respond and then I'm going to seriously open the window into tomorrow. Uh, one of my frustrations with the planning profession is they're planning a future and I'm not necessarily convinced that a lot of us actually understand the future. Uh, I'm not a technological evangelist. Uh, I think there are some major issues we need to discover, uh, but I'm also concerned that uh, we're applying our experience for the next 10 or, uh, 10 or 20 years to create a future which looks profoundly different to what we're seeing. So hold on to your hats because it does kind of ruffle a few feathers, uh, and, uh, but I'm not here to to stir the, well, I am here to stir the pot, but I'm not here to offend anyone. Uh, but I certainly do want to help you ha have a constructive conversation around the future. So it's not about today or tomorrow. It's about uh, understanding the future and then working back from there to where we are and then how we get there. So that's just a bit of an introduction. So I think I've probably covered the fact that I'm absolutely fascinated around the DNA of cities. Whilst they're all completely different, like every single person in the room, but we all have hearts, hands, eyes, ears, etc. Uh, and cities actually sets, have a lot of things in common that you can start to see the basic patterns. And the more I travel and the more mayors I talk to and the more CEOs I talk to, the more I realise that we're all actually facing many of the similar uh, problems in cities around the world. Uh, and so urban futures for me is about old school town planning. It's about the fact that planning profession was started from Le Corbusier, Ebenezer Howard, utopian thinking about creating the cities of the future to realise uh, mankind or uh, civilization, humankind, uh, to um, achieve the best for society. And so urban futures isn't really about prediction, it's about understanding today and where we want to go, the preferred, the possible, the potential, identifying that and, and empowering the community to be a part of the positive change. And a big part of that is that I fundamentally believe in the transformation of cities. Now, a lot of, a lot of people say nothing ever changes, but the truth is change happens every day, every week, every month and every year. And cities around the world are constantly changing. And getting our head around that is, is a really key part of this. You know, I'm sure many of you went to Melbourne 15 or 20 years ago to what was a desolate, soulless, um, crime-ridden heart. 
only to go back now and see what is arguably, and this is the Lord Mayor of Adelaide, the former Lord Mayor of Adelaide saying, the most vibrant, dynamic, probably the greatest city in the world. Uh, and there are tales of transformation happening all over the world. Copenhagen, uh, Amsterdam were car-centric cities. They haven't always been uh, bicycle meccas, uh, and they have now transformed themselves, and they've chose to make that, chosen to make that decision. If I am going to advertise Adelaide a bit, when I was Lord Mayor, it did go through a profoundly rapid transformation. I take no responsibility for that, and I don't want to uh, offend Christian. I don't know if he's still here um, yet, uh, but I want to sort of say that mayors and councillors actually don't do a lot. They're there to motivate people, and it's actually the staff that actually achieve uh, what needs to be done. People will achieve great things when motivated. And, and not uh, only the council staff, but the state government staff, but how they also work with the community. And I want to acknowledge every single one of you in the room for actually coming along tonight because you are engaged. You've ticked the box. You want to be a part of positive change in the community. And it's you working with your communities and working with the council that's going to see the specific changes in your city. So um, Adelaide did go through a rapid transformation. And uh, I really started to think about this notion of change and how change happens. There's a whole pile of psychology around change. Um, you know, the NIMBY syndrome of not in my backyard uh, and also getting people to understand how change works is, is a big part of it. I wanted to, to touch on one thing tonight and that is that planners, in fact, we all tend to think of cities as three-dimensional. Planners especially talk about cities in terms of height, scale, bulk, setbacks, uh, etc. But the truth is that there's another dimension to cities that isn't often uh, sort of analysed and that's that's time. And so this notion of time in cities is, is the additional dimension that we need to add to understanding how cities can actually be planned, but most importantly, how those plans need to come to fruition. Uh, and this is a tension that I tend to find. One of the things that someone might actually want to say tonight, and I want to get it out there before, is that it's all well and good to have a 25 or 50 year plan. That sits on the shelf. How do you physically de deliver it? You know, you do all this work and then nothing ever changes. Uh, although looking around, I've seen quite rapid transformation here in, in, in the, uh, from my last trip where I had a, had a great uh, look around. And for me, it's about this notion of planners and the tension between planning versus actually physically doing. So I want to talk about some of the doing tonight and it's about temporary spaces and the role that temporary activation plays in cities. Many of you would have heard of placemaking uh, and it's now really a worldwide movement uh, and I know Ethan Kent was here, I think he presented in Brisbane uh, yeah, yesterday and Cleveland. And, Cleveland. So, um, and some of you, just out of interest, did anyone see Ethan's presentation? We've got one person there. Um, so I'm not going to cover the same sort of stuff, um, but I am going to sort of go back to the essence of what good uh, city making is all about. Uh, and uh, you know, the city of Melbourne has really driven this notion of great streets make great cities. But for me, great s streets and great places make great cities. And one really good example is, and I reckon Brisbane and, and Adelaide probably fall into the same trap, is that certainly Adelaide has always been obsessed with being a big city. Uh, certainly Brisbane now is modelling itself as you know, uh, the next world city and that conversation. But if you go back to basics of what a big city is really all about, um, they think about it in a completely different way. Uh, a good example is Sydney's tagline. Does anyone know what Sydney's uh, city of Sydney, Sydney's tagline is as a city? Close early. <laughs> I can talk about that one. I can talk about that one another time. It's actually the city of villages, and if you think about some of the really great big cities of the world, who talk about this, what, what, what about what's a great city in the world that's got uh, is thought about as a city of villages? You got any examples in the room? New York. New York is a brilliant example of a city that prides itself on being a series of communities. Another one is London. And these are the really big cities of the world. And you know, Paris has all of its quarters and I could go on and on and on. And that's what creates a city. And this notion here is that if we just think about cities as being wanting to grow up, we tend to actually lose the focus on achieving things on a daily basis, that sense of time. And so the conversation I'm about to have is about focusing on individual streets and individual places. <coughs> and if you can physically get your planners, your community, your traders, your shop owners, your big businesses, um, everyone standing physically out in the street and having a conversation about how we fix that corner 
and that bit over there, you start to see change happen. <coughs> but you see a whole pile more than just stuff happening on your street. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, this is a great example. This is in Times Square. Maybe the most famous public space in the world. Trafalgar Square, Leicester Square, we could all name a whole pile, but this one's right up there. And I'm only putting this up because uh, it's got this shipping container in it. <coughs> so Times Square has recently been closed. Not that recently, it's been, been about 10 years. And many of you would have heard that all of Broadway in that precinct has been fundamentally closed. They closed it off, they painted the street, they got tables and chairs out, put them out, and those tables and chairs, not dissimilar to these, couldn't actually, they couldn't get them out fast enough for all the bums that started sitting on those seats. And all of a sudden it went from a, a street where people were jammed up on the side while all the cars and taxis went past to being a place absolutely covered with people. And it was a really interesting exercise and profoundly eye-opening. Now I use this example because they've used a shipping container and I really like shipping containers as a metaphor. So I'm going to use a few metaphors tonight. It's kind of my style. And this is a great metaphor for Lego. Who's seen the Lego movie? Just out of interest. Got a couple of hands? Oh, jeez. Lego. Lego? Lego. Lego. All right. Lego. Accent. Lego. Yeah, Lego. you can understand me, can't you? <laughs> anyway, so spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the Le Lego movie, there's a great metaphor for, uh, for how we think about our cities. So the Lego movie is about the fact, do you always remember when you buy some Lego, you put it together for your kids and then they rip it apart? And that saying is, I should have glued it together. You ever, ever processed that? Well, the Lego movie is about the fact that the adult wants to glue it together, but in fact, kids want to rip it apart because then they want to build something new and unique and be creative and do different things and have choices and options. And if you just see this as one big piece of Lego in the streets of a city, you can start to see that we look outside and most of our cities are built by gluing them together. We create permanent structures to our own great glory, assuming that future generations and future communities will want it exactly the same way as we damn well wanted it when we damn well paid for it. And this idea of actually reconstructing our cities by throwing Lego onto the streets and empowering the community a part of it is a great metaphor. And this is an example. This can be moved around. If it doesn't work here, it can be moved somewhere else. If the shop owners next door don't like it, it can be moved somewhere else. If another shop owner says, I like it because it's going to attract trade to my business, you can get another one or you can move this one around. And this is another wonderful example of how shipping containers have been work, uh, are now working. So this is Christchurch in New Zealand, sister city of Adelaide. I had the good fortune of going over there not long after the earthquake literally thumped the city. 80% of downtown was demolished. And in a very short space of time, they constructed an entire shopping centre. Now, I'm not saying that uh, you know, Sunshine Coast needs to get into the shipping container business, but what I am saying is that this is a wonderful example of how cities can become ephemeral. They can become temporary and you can start to experiment. And I think the experimentation is really important. This is another shipping container in New York. Uh, this is a whole building in New York that has been built out of shipping containers. It can be taken down quickly, it can be moved, it can be adaptable. And that's where I'm getting to in terms of how we create our cities. Uh, and so there's a whole pile of uh, a toolkit of things that you can use in your cities to start to respond more quickly. So you can start to physically see change happening in your cities today. I always like the, the, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy story and many of you would have read the book where Adelaide, uh, where, where, sorry, the Earth, um, okay Adelaide might be the centre of the Earth but anyway, uh, where the Earth is demolished because it's make, make, being made way for an international galactic highway and no one bothered to actually go down to the local council to see the plans and so you've got no right to complain. You know, who here really does go to the council to look at plans, etc., etc. This idea is about getting people onto the streets and actually engaging with them in the process of city making and city building. This is another wonderful example. Does anyone know what this is? Anyone want to give this a go? It's, um, rapping, rap it's, a, it's a dance floor. So this is another example from Christchurch. They call it a gap filler and it's actually called a dancer mat. And yes, this isn't necessarily what you're going to do here, but it's a wonderful example of resources being used in clever ways. Now, most of you would say, oh, I'm not going to dance on that floor, but building cities is not all about you. 
One of the great things about cities is their diversity and cities need young people for urban regeneration. They're actually a tool for urban regeneration. They're a tool because they spend money in different ways. They keep other businesses al alive. Often they're the entrepreneurs in your community. And so it might not be for you and some of this stuff might not make sense to you. Um, but once again, it's all about the diversity of our cities and creating a resilient community where people of all ages, all types, actually want to use your city, call your city home and create the new economies of the future. This is another example in Denmark at the Carlsberg Beer Factory. Uh, now, um, it looks like Lego and this is all seating that they're put in in the process of reactivating it for residential development. I like it too because it's another example of the ephemeral nature of cities. You know, no one would want to sit outside in a Danish winter but it's very quick, cheap and easy to put this infrastructure in for half of a year. I was up in Townsville recently doing some work and talking about placemaking and one of the engineers said, yeah, but is it uh, cyclone proof? Well, the perfect thing is if it's light and quick and easy to stick in, you can actually take it out during that part of the season and put it somewhere else, stick it in the, the storage area and, and then when it comes out, maybe it goes into a different part of the city to start to experiment, to collect data, to work with your local residents, to work with your local businesses to see what works so that when you do choose to use glue, you're not spending $5 million on a project that the community aren't comfortable with and this can get the community comfortable uh, with the sorts of things that you can do uh, before you actually do the permanent work. So another great example is Parking Day. Now this is a worldwide movement in the cities around about 200 cities in the world uh, and what they've done is on a single day they get um, people to actively use car parking spaces in the city for something different. Now absolutely we need car parking spaces in cities and I'm not anti-car, I'm all about integrated transport and if you want me to do another presentation on integrated transport it's a topic I'm passionate about but not today. But what this is is about showing that you know, we can activate our streets as David Ingwich talks about is mental speed bumps. Do we want uh, streets which are 80% of the public realm of our cities to be places people move through or places that people stop and experience interact. The slower someone walks in the street, the more likely they are to go into a shop, spend money. And there's a whole pile of data that's about creating cities for people and in creating high quality amenities. The single biggest fear of a woman when she goes shopping is the speed of vehicles. Because if you've got kids, etc., it's not exactly where you want to be. Who here wants to have a dining experience next to a freeway? And this sort of stuff, is about showing that you can use cities in different ways. Uh, you will be pro-development if you can calm traffic and increase the amenity of an environment because more people want to live in those sorts of environments. Who wants to live next to a traffic jam? Uh, and so by calming traffic and creating these sorts of environments, you start to actually make them more appealing for residents and that's that integrated use where people can then walk to shopping have those experiences and, and transform their communities into walkable communities where you start to get to know the names of the local shops, the names of your next door neighbours and have that, that more human experience. Um, I get a lot of cynicism from this because most people have spent their entire life looking out of a car window. Uh, but the most stressful thing you will do today is drive a car unless you've, your marriage is on the rocks or, or you've got some bills to pay. But even then, car driving is right up there. It's not... You know, we spend a lot of money on our transport and if we can actually get people, younger people especially, to live in higher density environments and walk everywhere, they may not need to spend their first $15,000 on buying a car and then paying for insurance. They may invest it in a new business. They may invest it in travelling and getting international experience and exposure which makes them a better person and a better entrepreneur and better connected when they come back to your community. This is another example of placemaking. So this is Vancouver. They put this bike lane in overnight. They sent, and I know in this case it was the boys, they sent the boys from the depot in the dark of night and put it out there and lo and behold, bang, they've got a bicycle lane. If it doesn't work, it's okay. They can actually take it out in the dark of night and lo and behold, it disappears. And this is about inducing experimental stuff into your city. It's not about saying, I don't want change. It's about, let's give it a go, collect some data, and see what happens. There's a great example in Adelaide where we closed a street and the hairdresser, and we all know the hairdresser is the, the, you know, every elected member lobbies the hairdresser first because they talk to everyone in the community. 
and the hairdresser said to me, if you close this street, I'm going to make sure that you don't get elected at the next election. But we put temporary bollards up, closed the street, got the data, proved that it worked, and then six months later he said, if you open this street, I'm going to make sure that no one votes for you again. <laughs> but what we did is we knocked on a door and said, we're going to give it a go. We're not going to put up permanent infrastructure. It's not about making change, forcing change. It's about seeing change work. If it doesn't work, we can experiment, we can adapt, we can do different things. And getting that into the community. This is one I really like. This is in Toronto. You reckon the other one was going to be lighter, quicker and cheaper? You can knock this up in seconds flat. You can get the data and you can see if it works and if it doesn't work, that's okay. If it does work and more cyclists come, you can move it 10 centimetres a night with no one looking and lo and behold it's a three-lane bicycle lane. There's a whole pile of different things you can do. And these are just examples of inducing that experimental culture. Food trucks is another one. I've got another slide that says don't ban the van. I think it should be don't ban the Greg van myself, but that's, I've got to get that slide set. Watch out for that one. And we put a whole pile of food trucks into the city of Adelaide and they're everywhere. Like, this is a multi-billion dollar industry in the US now. Culturally, um, I'm going to say it, the kids love it. Not everyone wants to have a pint and a palmy at the pub and pay 12, 15, 15 to 20 dollars for it. Um, and the idea of actually activating our city squares in Adelaide uh, was a really big part of it. You've got lots of public space here uh, and when the city's growing and it's new uh, and you, know, you want to activate public spaces, it's a great way. Entrepreneurs and creating an entrepreneurial ecosystem, when you were in your 20s and you wanted to start a business, did you have half a million dollars to sign a lease for two years and fit it out? Or did you get your first $100,000 by buying a crappy old van fitting it out, selling some burgers, getting the dough and then actually getting a hole in the wall as your second business. And this is about the fact that you've got to create that ecosystem and the entrepreneurialism. And you get your tacos, you get your burgers uh, and as I said, young people love it. Kids don't want shiny gold taps. They don't want fancy stuff. They want to sit in a laneway on a crusty old stool with a four buck beer thinking they're reinventing their city. You know, the University of Adelaide, the Vice-Chancellor said we had a big budget to reinvent the, the university grounds, um, but all the kids wanted is second-hand furniture that was mismatched. They want that. They want that edgy stuff. They want to be different. They want to be unique. Um, and so gorilla, gorilla gardening is another one, and I won't go into it, but Vancouver, Edmonton in Canada, great examples. If there's ever a blank space, they plant something in it. And so this notion that you can engage the community and doing a whole pile of different things around community gardens and community space and greening of cities. I put this one up because it's a great segue uh, from the community garden and community bomb. Um, out of interest, does anyone know who this artist is? We've got a Banksy at the back? Correct. If you don't know, Banksy is the Don Bradman. Uh, I don't, who's the best rugby league player? Go on. Wally Lewis, isn't he? Wally Lewis, yeah. He's the Wally. He's the Wally Lewis of rugby, an absolute icon. And I put this up because another one I think is a really important tool for placemaking is public art. And you can put up a knock up, a, uh, you can do a bronze statue or you can do 30 murals in your city. And once again, a blank wall is not a neutral statement. It says to your community, you aren't young people, we don't want you here. You can make sta statements around values and community. You can talk about your aspirations and your, your hopes for the future. It's a very easy way. The number one visited uh, tourist feature in Melbourne is its public art and its graffiti. Another example, and I'm conscious of time, is we had Splash Adelaide. So Splash Adelaide was our gateway to telling the community, we want to work with you to do cool stuff in our city. And it's about this sense of, um, I remember when I was a councillor and a mayor, I walked out of my door and everyone in the community said, you need to do this, you need to do this, and you need to do this. And often I was saying, well, why don't you do it? And so this is about moving from big government to, and small community to small government and big community. It's actually you, the people in this room, that are going to transform this city, not the mayor, not the councillors, not the council staff. It's about getting the community engaged. And we engage the small businesses to do a whole pile of placemaking activities. You know, something as small as going down to Bunnings, getting some deck chairs, putting them in a public space, knocking on the local business and say, can you keep an eye on them? And instead of the business saying, it's not my problem, actually getting them to realise that if you activate that space, they'll sell more food that day. And it's those sorts of challenges around it. And a whole range of things around cinema and, 
and, and public. It's not just about public space. So we stole from Renew Newcastle, this model of Renew Adelaide, uh, a whole pile of vacant buildings in Adelaide. There's vacant buildings in virtually every main street in Australia. And how can they be used to get young people to create new art galleries, new small bars, uh, new workshops, new sort of selling designer clothes, reinvigorating that local... Uh, local. And, and so just to wrap this up, this is a great model because it's affordable. You know, David Ingwich talked about activating places for $5,000. A mural can either be free, um, but by the, not actually just buffing out the, the local street artists who are doing it, um, or it can cost as little as three grand to do. You should pay your local artists. Not only is it affordable, but it's outcome orientated. Instead of having staff pushing paper, um, you're actually getting them out on the streets and they talk, they have a conversation. The traders come out and we all have conversation around how we can transform cities. And you're actively engaging the community. And you start walking down streets that you haven't seen change in years. And all of a sudden it creates new cultures. One in the organisation, morale goes up. You delegate, you get the staff out on the streets. You can go to the depot and actually look at all the stuff you've got piled up at the depot and get the council workers to actually do something with it and stick it out. I bet there's a piece of art at the depot that can be plonked somewhere so that someone gets a pleasant surprise on Monday, for example. Um, and it creates a new culture in the community because they get new experiences. Um, and then the temporary becomes legitimate. And this is really important for, for futures because then change becomes legitimate. Instead of a community working about how they're going to stop change, change becomes a part of the society. If it's temporary, if it's ephemeral, if it's different, if it's new, if it's being pushed around, the community starts to see change as the norm and it creates this new urban language where you're a part of the change that you want to see in your cities. And then you've got this whole new conversation happening. happening. And uh, it's also about that aggressive notion of active intervention and getting out there and being a part of it and also learning. So if you throw stuff on the streets and it doesn't work, that's okay. You move it around and see if that works. You get the traders to come out and say, why don't we put that over there? And if it doesn't work, it's okay. You get the boys or the girls from the depot, you pick it up, you put it on the truck, go around the corner and you start all over again and it doesn't cost the council much. They're going to make mistakes. That's fantastic because they're trying new things. You've got to back them and you've got to get the elected members letting the administration do this stuff. And when they make a mistake, the councillors and the mayor have to say, at least we're giving stuff a go. And you start to experiment and do that. And by doing that, you create a flexible city and a flexible community um, and you create this, this experimental uh, culture where you can create and ultimately transform. And one of the keys with Adelaide City Council, in, and this is one for Christian, is that the council has delegated to the staff to get out there and do this, get cracking, and I was always pleasantly surprised. The irony is I got the credit for it and didn't even know it was coming. But the truth is that people achieve great things when motivated and empowering the staff to get out there and work with the community is a big part of that. So that's my placemaking thing. I'll get cracking because I've got a little bit more to cover. Um, cities are all about people, but just out of interest, who's got a smartphone on them? Right, yeah, they've penetrated society in a major way and they are starting to change how cities work. And I sort of talk about this because... You know, technology is a key driver. Light bulbs change the architecture and built form of cities in a major way. People were able to go outdoors, there were less fires, candles sort of started to disappear, new architectural built form, and you're starting to see it now with LED lights on cities. This is another one. You know. Who's going to tell me here that the car didn't find, define cities in the 21st century? 30% of public space is now, 30% of our entire cities are all about cars. We create huge parking lots for them, they actually define... Did you know that street cleaners, uh, streets are actually defined uh, by how a street cleaner can use them? We have actually designed our roads for the street cleaner and that's the minimum standard as well as the ability for cars to turn around, etc. But technology is changing rapidly and we all sit around our barbecues marvelling at how much that's changed. My son is the same age as the iPhone. He thinks that's pretty cool. And of course, only iPads have only been around for about five years, but they are now <coughs> absolutely permeated in, in our society. Now, I could talk forever on this stuff because there is an infinite array of technology and I'm, I love this stuff and I'm really fascinated by it and I've got lots of examples and I'm sure someone afterwards will come up and give me another example. I'm very lucky I go to the World City Summit every second year. 
um, now a part of their alumni and I see an amazing floor of IBM, Cisco, a whole range of technologies that are fundamentally changing the operating system of cities. In fact, the biggest players in cities now are not town planners or elected members, they're IBM, they're Cisco. Um, and Google now has sidewalk laboratories. Um, by the way, does anyone know what the company uh, Alphabet is? Does anyone know the company Alphabet? Did you know it's actually the biggest company in the world? It's the holding company for Google. So there's a little fact for you. And they're getting into cities. Apple's about to release a car. They've got their smarts. Um, uh, they've got um, a whole pile of smart home technology. Um, you can now buy something called the Amazon Echo, uh, where you can actually talk to uh, just the room. The Echo sits over there. And I'd say, Amazon, what's the temperature today? Amazon, turn the lights down. Uh, a guy's hacked into his Amazon Echo so that he can now get his roller door open. His Tesla can come out by itself, electronic car. The roller door goes down, the air conditioner goes on, and he walks out and gets in the car. All from just, Amazon, can you get my car out? And that's where we're going with this stuff. Um, this is very quickly, Gordon, um, Gordon Moore was in Tell, Moore's Law, very famous law, it's about exponential growth. Got a great party trick for you, won't do it tonight, but just as in one year, if something is one and it doubles in a year, it goes to two. And the next year it goes to four, and the year afterwards it goes to eight. You know, by the time you get to 60, it's going from one billion to two billion, and then it's two billion to four billion. So in the same amount of time, when it first starts, it doesn't seem like a big change, but right at the end, you're talking monster numbers. This is happening with technology. If you think what has happened in the last 10 years is amazing, it's about to accelerate profoundly in a big way. And this is where I say, if we're going to apply the last 20 years to planning the future of cities, it's a joke. And I get really concerned and quite worried about the fact that you know, middle-aged uh, men in their 50s and 60s in grey suits are applying the last 20 years to create a tomorrow that looks nothing like they've ever experienced. And so I'm a big fan of young people, you may have noticed, because they're digitally literate and they're actually programmed for change, they get out of bed for change and they understand the future better than most people do. You know, most of the leaders still get their EA to print up their, and check into their flights and do all the technology. You know, they, they really don't get it. And uh, one thing I like about being a sole trader is I have to learn how to check in and do all this tech stuff. Um, and so we're all geospatial now. So every single one of you with a smartphone is connected to the curvature of the earth. Every single app knows where you are, how you're moving, and is starting to actually use uh, artificial intelligence and algorithms to understand your movements, etc. I can get into my car in Adelaide and um, it can tell me how many minutes it's going to take me to get home. And it's starting to know my patterns and make some assessments. And so I put this up just as a bit of a stir, a bit of a challenge. But the point here is that they've surveyed people in England, young people, and they asked them whether they wanted a 4G phone or a car, and they pretty much all picked a 4G phone because they can move seamlessly through the city. They can see when the train is coming. They can contact their friends. They can buy products online. They can interact in a whole range of different ways. And a car is just something that's going to cost them a lot of money and achieve very little. I like to give the example of, I saw a picture in the Indian Times of a guy who won a BMW, really expensive car. And, and he was standing next to it looking really proud. And I was thinking, who the hell wants to have a BMW in, in New Delhi? You know, you've got to dodge the cows, you've got to dodge the elephants, and there are elephants in New Delhi. You're going to get scratched. Where the hell do you park it? What about the insurance? What a nightmare. When you can actually get on an auto rickshaw and go across the other side of town for next to nothing, for the same price the fuel's going to cost you. And so we're starting to see new vectors based on technology. And there are lots of different examples about not just Facebook and Twitter, um, but virtually all your apps know where you are and will help you understand that. And I'd like to use this example very quickly. Has anyone heard of clout? Okay, so clout is something that you log in your Twitter and your Facebook, and this might not be you, and I get that, but it is the future, and it is increasingly going to be a saturation point. And it measures your social media influence, so it gives you a score out of 100. So just as TV stars and mayors or, or radio producers were the people that get free tickets to stuff and think they're really powerful and they control society, in the future, if you've got a really high clout score, not just about how many followers you've got, not whether you've got sort of you know, 10,000 followers or on Twitter or 30,000 followers on Twitter or whatever, but how much people engage with you and have that conversation with you. So 
Uh, Obama's got a score of 99. Justin Bieber's got a score of 100, for example. <laughs> Why is this important? Because we, are start, we will start to become digital beacons who move through physical space. So if you go to the San Francisco airport you can, and you've got a clout score of over 60, you'll get into the business class lounge for free. If you uh, book in a hotel, some hotels will now check your clout score and give you a service commensurate to your ability to influence other people. When you walk through the Queen Street Mall in 15 years' time and they use near-field technology to understand how influential you are, that will determine the amount of percentage you're offered in each of the shops that you walk through and all of a sudden how we move through cities. There are lots of examples of this and I'll get to some of them, social media ones, in the future. This is a really practical example that will be rolling out to a city near you. So the good old-fashioned uh, street light, you know, you used to have to put it, you know, light it at night and now they came out with those wonderful, are they sulphur halide? I always get it. Is it sulphur, the lights, the sulphur halide, is that the term? Sure, sodium. Sodium, sodium. Sodium halide. Yeah. Um, they give off a single colour and we've spent the last 30 years seeing our cities in a reddish hue, if you realise. Now if you start to see the LED lights coming out, that's a great innovation. LED lights are a really significant change. A lot less electricity need to be changed hardly any one, every nine years. Um, use a lot less electricity and the actual Kelvin temperature provides light at a different, it's a bluer light, which actually means that you see movement uh, more effectively and you actually can see periphery when you're driving. Hugely safer to get through cities. But the next generation is a street light that will be able to discreetly collect all this information and start to actually see cities operating in real time. So at the moment, planning is just an art. We guess. We have a feeling and a hunch. And then the community are able to question it and have a different opinion. In the future, we're going to start to see all this data coming through in real time. Who here has played SimCity? Yeah, got a handful of people. Cool, some budding, budding city planners. Um, I used to pretend to be the mayor of a city. It was so cool. Um, but that was when I was uh, Lord Mayor of the city. But anyway, um, and so it gets to the point where you'll start to see cities being managed in real time, where the planners here will have a dashboard and they will physically see everything happening. I like to use the example of George Street. So I went to do a, a, a fundamental t technology in cities presentation. I was hot because I was running a bit late. But being a town planner, I was able to look around and see, work out that George Street's got a wind tunnel effect, which is where the wind blows because of the high-rise buildings. And I was able to go, oh, that's kind of cool. Took two steeps this way and I got a huge breeze and I knew what I was doing and that was a proud moment as a planner because I can read the patterns and I can see the data in my head. And that's what planners do. But in the future, using all of this stuff and all of this data, not only will you see it on a piece of paper, on, on a screen, and you'll be able to maybe just put in a food truck in a place and see how it physically changes the wind patterns and changes the temperature, but any one of you who's standing on that street corner will have a smartwatch that will say, you're a little bit hot. If you take two steps to the right, you'll be in the wind and it will cool you down. And this is going to happen. And I've got lots of examples and not much time. So another example is, sorry? You got plenty of time. Oh, cool. Let's have a long conversation. <laughs> and so augmentation is another really great example. And I've got a video I won't show. But now I can go to a music festival. I can hold my phone up with a certain app and I can actually see where all the stages are. I can see where the bathrooms are. Just by and it will show augmented through the camera uh, where I'm going. More importantly, it will show me where all the bars are, uh, etc. Uh, I've seen examples in San Francisco of augmentation where you can stand there and you can stand in Pike Markets and you can see all the heritage buildings that used to be there. You can now actually have augmented of three-dimensional images of things in your city, like dinosaurs walking through your city or are things to point your way to where you're going and so you can start to move through cities in completely unique ways. The data that we're getting will tell us don't go that way, it's going to be quicker to go that way. It will be able to run algorithms on you know, how much time you've got, how much um, calories you've consumed, how many calories you need to use that day, uh, where the free bicycle is or whether it's quicker by public transport or whether it's about time you actually did some walking and it will be able to give you this advice and it will be able to communicate with you and you'll be able to use this sort of 
technology. Another change of topic, because I just wanted to touch on some stuff, just to give you a sense of the fact that cities will change, is the share economy. Now, I always kind of joke about this. If you ever want to come to Adelaide and come for a bike ride, I run an Airbnb in Adelaide, so you can give us a hoy. Um, but the truth is that the share economy is now really starting to challenge cities. So Reykjavik in Iceland has just included some legislation to control uh, Airbnb and the share economy. Uh, I know that um, there are cities, San Francisco is debating this in a major way uh, and there are other cities around the world that are starting to challenge it. It's fascinating. There's no one simple rule. So it is changing because I know someone in Melbourne who now rents 20 properties to, and runs them as Airbnbs and makes a living out of it. But of course, if you want to rent a property to live in in Melbourne, um, you can walk in and say, you know, it's a half a million dollar property. I'm prepared to rent that for $500 a week. They'll take it for 600 because they can make $1,500 from it. And it's starting to change. I'll get, can we do questions Airbnb. afterwards? Okay, so Airbnb is, um, it's, it's Airbnb is actually the biggest hotel provider on the planet. It's bigger than um, the Hilton chain or anything. But what it is, it's local communities renting out a bedroom in their place. So I'm staying in Brisbane at the moment and I'm staying in an Airbnb where if you booked online, I'm staying in a guy's house. And I met the owner, has a bit of a chin wag. I've got a room, he make, gives me a, a, a towel, changes the sheets, etc. I run it out the back of my house in a loft. It's like a hotel room. Now, four or five hours of work a week, I've made about 20 grand with 80% occupancy. Um, and they are now, they, Airbnb does not own a single building or a single hotel room. I run it myself, take the photographs, put it up, I run the business through an app and they are now the biggest provider of accommodation on the face of the planet. Now, in terms of the Gold Coast, I'll give you an example. Um, I keep saying to the Gold Coast stuff, uh, Council, you should be concerned because it's going to drive the value of rental properties through the roof and it should be restricted. You shouldn't get someone buying 20 properties and running them uh, as Airbnbs. But the other side is maybe the Sunshine Coast, and I use this example in Townsville, and I also like the example of um, milk farmers. I'll use the milk farmers one. You know, who doesn't want to take their kids to a rural property and get your kids to milk the cows, see how it all works, walk around the farm, sit outside at night time and see the Milky Way. Now, if the milk farmers are doing it really tough, why wouldn't we encourage them to actually have a second dwelling on site or an extra room in their house and they provide this service? Um, a great example for Townsville is, you know, if you want development in your city and a developer wants to build 20 apartments, maybe someone is going to say, I'll take five of those from you and run them as Airbnb and you get additional development. You get more housing diversity for short-term stays so that not everyone's staying in the motel. You're not begging the Hilton to come because they're never going to build a big hotel there. You're actually getting short-term accommodation provided in unique ways. And you can actually get different types of short-term accommodation diversity. So I'd say in a rural area or in a smaller city, maybe even the Sunshine Coast at the moment, it's a great opportunity to encourage people to come here and not just stay in a hotel because, you know, if you've got kids and you want a kitchen, etc., it's a good outcome. But on the other side, there are a huge amount of issues in terms of uh, economics, land uses, a whole range of things. And so this is going to be a really big challenge for the future. Another one, of course, is Uber. Now, we not want to acknowledge my client, the state government, who's not necessarily keen on Uber. Um, but, you know, I think we should bring back blacksmiths and Kodak they were so hard done by by not adapting to change that we should all put a hand in our pocket and pay a dollar each to Kodak. Um, and the list goes on. Video store owners. Does anyone here feel sorry for video store owners? The truth is, whether you like what I'm saying or not, the world is going to change in a major way. Um, you know, I was talking today about the knowledge economy and one thing we've got to ask is, you know, what jobs aren't going to exist in the future? Uh, my son is seven. By the time he finishes university, his, your, his mobile phone will be smarter than him. What does that actually mean? It's true, it's real, it's coming. Um, here's a great one for any. Are there any lawyers in the room? I, I'm not going to... Oh! Yeah, someone's kicked... Yeah. 
someone mentions lawyer and you kick the Yeah, yeah. <laughs> can, I, I'll, can I take questions afterwards? Is that okay? Is that all right? I'm, I'm absolutely more than happy to have a conversation. I've just finished my piece and then we can have a conversation. I'm ha happy to stick around as well. Lawyers is a great example. There is already a supercomputer that can run legal assessments at 90% accuracy when a human can being can do it at 70%. So, you know, we worry about, you know, the Coles checkout person and the, the dr truck driver, etc. And they're all issues. Like, I think we need to protect some jobs and some crafts uh, and some traditional employment. Um, but the truth is, if you're doing a law degree now, you're probably going to be out of a job in 10 years' time. So it's not just labourers. There's a whole range of jobs that are going to be completely decimated. And if you can get a more accurate legal assessment from a computer than a human, you're probably going to take it. And so, you know, if you're doing a law degree, you've got any friends, you can certainly have a bit of fun with them. And the share economy is the, another one the, with the Airbnb, I mean with the, the Uber. So, you know, if you haven't used Uber, I must admit, I'm personally, at the moment, it's illegal, so I wouldn't recommend you use it in Brisbane. Um, but it's like, don't you hate it when kids say, I don't like that food, but they've never tried it? If you don't like Uber and you've never tried it, you're just being that kid, you know? And you can be very cynical about things in life, but unless you've actually bothered... You know, if you don't like apples and you've never tried it, well, you know, your friends are going to laugh at you. And I think this is a part of it. I think you've got to realise it. My mum is 70 years old and doesn't use technology. I'm hoping she's got 20 more years to live. And if you reckon 20 years is long enough to adapt, evolve, learn and get into something, kind of, you can learn to play the guitar in five, you know, let alone, not well. <laughs> and I still haven't got there but you see the point um, we can stick our head in the sand but if you're under the age of if you're in your 50s or 60s you've got 30 years and this stuff is coming and so that's the challenge that I guess I, I put out there Uber's a really interesting one this is from India so it's not just about a taxi it's about getting an auto rickshaw for a few cents or you might want to get a small car in um, Oslo you can choose to get an electric car and interestingly enough once they swipe it, I'll give you a tip for a woman overseas. If you're travelling in a country overseas by yourself, Uber's not a bad deal because you swipe it and the moment they start, they're GPS tracking it and they, someone in the world knows where you are and it's being tracked so it's a bit safer. And so there's a whole part of When you hail an Uber, you can physically see the car coming on a GPS map there. You can literally walk out the door when you know it's arriving. And it's not about Uber today. This is about the future. So Uber is actually saying they're going to be a company with no employees. They're getting uh, autonomous vehicles up, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but additionally, it's just early days. I like to use the example that I've never met Greg's kids, and um, Greg's never met my daughter. But based on some of the stuff that I've been talking about, um, in about 15 years' time, our phones are going to know uh, how much we rate each other based on our clout scores, on our interactions. Our phones will actually read the tone of our voice when we speak. They'll know how long we speak to each other, what words we use in our emails, and it will actually understand the relationship that we have and the value we place on that relationship. This could be the end of a beautiful friendship. Yeah, I know. No more lies. Absolutely. Uh, but the point there is, one day my daughter is going to be standing on a street corner in Paris, Actually, she's in Rome at the moment. Let's say Rome, 21-year-old uh, daughter, in, which makes me worry in Rome. But anyway, she's going to be standing on a street corner in Rome and she's going to sort of either identify or because of her diary, her phone will know where she's going. One of Greg's children is going to be going past in a share car and based on the algorithms, that, that Greg's child's phone is going to say, Stephen Yarwood's daughter is, is going in the same direction and there's a trust score of X, Y and Z. They're a pretty good person. They've been really nice. Um, there is a trust level there. Would you like to pick them up? And so I kind of get to the point where I think that, you know, remember asbestos and how at the time it was a really good idea? And cigarette smoking. And I don't want to offend any cigarette smokers in the room, um, but, you know, we don't think that's a particularly good idea. I can't help but think that 1.2 people per car is going to be considered like cigarette smoking and asbestos one day. We have these massive cars and we all drive around one person in each car. It makes no sense and in the future we'll look back and go, I can't believe we burnt all that precious fuel to move one person in those big beasts. 
Not anti-car, I love cars, I have Porsche, love my electric cars, all that sort of stuff, but it just doesn't make sense. And so that's a good example of where all of this is absolutely going. This is another one. I put driverless car up there because I don't believe in the term driverless car. A hundred years ago, we were all on horse and carriage and then we got these big metal beasts and we called them dr horseless carriages. Horseless carriage. We applied horse and cart mentality to the new thing. If you think horseless carriage, now we're saying driverless car. We haven't learnt from our mistake. They're not driverless cars. They're something completely different. And just as you could honestly say that horse and cart and cars were completely different. Cars fundamentally changed cities. O autonomous vehicles will fundamentally redefine cities. They're not cars. They're not going to behave like cars. They're going to do hugely different things. And some people say, oh, I don't like them, you know, all those sorts of things. Well, the different, one small difference is when you're in a car, do you get a chance to speak to your child who's strapped up in the baby seat in the back? Driving a car is not a pleasant experience. It's stressful. In the autonomous vehicle age, you will sit in the back with your kids and help them with their homework. You will have a completely different experience. I also believe that we won't own them. There's no point. Just as the share economy, I think the smart people are going to buy the first 100 share. If I could, I'd buy the first 100 autonomous vehicles that came out and then you could all use them and it'll only cost you 15 cents a kilometre to move around and it will be a bucket load cheaper than buying a car and having the responsibility and you'll still be able to walk out the door when it arrives and then when you get to going, it'll drop you off at the door. Who wants to circle the block three times looking for a car when you can step out of the vehicle, walk to exactly three steps to be where you are and that just vehicle nips off and goes, goes and does something completely different. Not your problem and a bucket load cheaper. It's cost 50 grand to buy a car park in Adelaide and then you've got your car. Who wants to knock off 100 grand for a vehicle when you could actually just step out, get into it, step out, get out to it, it disappears and over a period of 20 years you spend 20 grand. Like, what's the point in owning a car? And one quick example, you drive off in a car and it takes two seconds for the next car to go. Yeah? Isn't that that whole, I'm not going to make it through this traffic light because everyone takes a few seconds to, to leave and takes one car at a time the next car? It's called the concertina effect. If you think of a piano accordion going in and out, you know, the first car goes and the next car goes and it stretches out. We've all had that frustration. Well, autonomous vehicles are like those little Thomas the Tank Engines with magnets. They go off exactly like a train. They all leave at the same space. And the research says you can fit seven autonomous vehicles into the space of a single car. And so if you're now getting... 2.5 people per autonomous vehicle because of the share nature and you're getting seven cars into the space of a single car, you've just increased that road's capacity to carry people, which is what cars are doing, that's all they're for, carrying people, by 20-fold by introducing them. So, you know, at the moment, yes, we do need to deal with congestion and we need to, to widen roads and deal with bottlenecks, but if you want to build freeways that are going to last 50 or 60 years, you're building obsolete technology that won't get used. And so these are the sorts of examples of applying today's mentality of building freeways for cars when we won't actually have them. That's like saying, you know, horse and carriages are going to make a comeback. It's just not going to happen. Now, a bit of cynicism, yeah, 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 not going to happen in a lifetime. You've all got mobile phones now. That took seven years. Look what's going to happen. By 2040, which is within roughly the time frame of this conversation, Mercedes-Benz reckons 75% of you are going to be driving autonomous vehicles. Greg tweeted something about the fact that only 15% of people are actually trusting of autonomous vehicles now. I get that. About 100 years ago, only 15% of people trusted um, uh, horseless carriages. Look what happens now. I bet half a dozen of you in this room were never going to have a smartphone and now you've got one. And if you haven't got one, you you'll probably get one sooner or later because they're kind of cool. And so this is all the stuff that is coming whether you like it or not. As a futurist, there's a saying, if something doesn't sound absurd, you're probably not talking about the right thing. But this is going to happen. Right, this is going to happen whether you like it or not. And it's going to happen within pretty much the life because everyone's in their 30s and 40s in the room. 
<laughs> took a second. Um, this is pretty much going to happen with every single person in this room in their lifetime. And so just a bit of a, a close-up of that. So, you know, what, another quick example of how that changes cities, because I think there's a lot of research going in, but as a former mayor and as a planner and a futurist, I think it's the trickle-on effects that we don't understand and it's the policy, it's policy decisions we're making. So redefine streets, really, really quick example. Have I got a laser? Yep, cool. Um, is the fact that at the moment we have a footpath, we have a parking lane, we have traffic lanes and then we go here. My thesis is, and I've never heard anyone else talk about this, at the moment in Adelaide they're getting bicycles on footpaths, but now they want to control the speed limit of a bicycle to 10 kilometres an hour. And I keep asking myself, does that mean you can't run faster than 10 kilometres an hour on a street, on a footpath? Are we going to ban joggers? And then we start thinking about the fact that we're talking about the pedestrian, the cyclist, the car. But I've got a, I've got a collection of slides. You know, I've seen a kid in in Brisbane using an electric skateboard. I saw people using segways in uh, the uh, Botanic Gardens today. You can get those, they're called hoverboards, they're banned at the moment, but you can get hoverboards or you can ride along. I've seen old ladies in Taiwan on little three-wheelers. I've seen morbidly obese people at Disneyland on really big four-wheelers. You know, these things are electric vehicles. Who's been in a 100% electric vehicle here? Yeah? couple of people. What was it like? Yeah? Yeah? Um, if you haven't been in one, people think they're slow. Electric engines have absolute instant torque all the time. They don't have a high end top speed, but they accelerate faster than a normal car. The current Tesla can, the best Tesla can do 0 to 100 as a sedan that's like a Commodore in about three seconds. It destroys everything, including a Lamborghini, Ferrari, etc. And does it with no noise at two cents per kilometre for petrol. Well, two cents per kilometre for electricity. And because of you're getting rid of uh, feed-in tariffs, those people are going to want to be charging it during the day with their mobile battery to get the uh, solar power, and that's going to start to be... You will all start to have batteries in your houses. That's another whole conversation. Tesla is not a car manufacturing company. It's a battery manufacturing company that just happens to make cars. It's just, about, it's just finished building the biggest factory in the world, a gigafactory, to bring down the cost of battery technology. And you will have batteries in your house. That's another whole topic. Anyway, so using that GPS, your phone knowing what you're doing, moving, etc. You know, I, I reckon one day we're going to actually say, OK, that's five kilometres an hour. doesn't matter whether you're on a scoot, scooter, skateboard or whatever it is. You can only do five. If you go above that, your phone's going to tell you to move. You've got 10 seconds or you will be fined. And that's going to be 10 kilometres an hour. This might be 20, that might be 30, that might be 50. And it actually doesn't really matter whether you're on a pedelec, which is an electric-assisted bicycle, two-wheeler, three-wheeler, four-wheeler, seven-wheeler. You're running. If you're jogging really fast, you've got to move lanes. Um, and sounds old-fashioned, but I like the idea of actually slow walkers walking to the left-hand side. There's another whole conversation about the fastest walkers in the world. In Denmark, in, in Copenhagen, I don't talk about bicycles. Um, there actually is a line down the middle of the footpath because it's got the cobblestones. And everyone walks on the right-hand side because they're funny in Europe and they do everything the opposite to us. But it's the fa second fastest walking city in the world because everyone walks that side and the people coming the other way. And that's just a small example of increasing the productivity of cities. And I think there's some older people in the room who would say, yeah, it's nice that a guy would get up and talking about moving to the left, because um, that actually makes sense about increasing the productivity of our cities. So just to finish off, whole pile of conversation around smart cities. Um, what is a smart city? There's lots of debate. Personally, I think a smart person is someone who knows what time to get out of bed, knows what clothes they're going to wear, knows where they're going, knows that there's food on the table at the end of the day and knows that they've got to pay their bills. And I think that's kind of like what a smart city is. Smart city is a city that looks after its constituents and gives them all the basic needs. But we are moving to intelligent cities. Our phones are pretty intelligent now. AI is in your phones right now. Um, and the guy that's actually doing Tesla, the electric car company, is also doing SpaceX, which is, means that people are going to buy tickets to go to space. He's also doing... <coughs> He's also doing open sourcing of artificial intelligence and it's accelerating in a major way. But what we are going to go to 
is this sense of a cognitive city where all of your phones, if all of your phones are AI, but they're all talking to each other and creating a mesh of AI, I've kind of got this idea that potentially the city becomes a cognitive being. I, I describe cities as not rocket science. It's actually infinitely more complex. And um, they're living, breathing organisms. I love it. I always talk to doctors and I kind of have a conversation around how cities are like humans and then I explain that cities are more complex than humans because it's humans plus their interactions. And they get awfully disappointed when you tell them that. Um, but you know, this is starting to get to the point where cities are going to start to use technology um, to, to do things. And so if artificial intelligence is self-learning, it assumes, it adapts, it predicts, it finds typical and untypical patterns, etc. That's what planners do now. But when they've got this data, the city starts to take on a whole new operating system. Um, and I like this metaphor because at the moment we all wear watches. But I do think that it's going to get to the point where our watches are watching everything we do. Not a technological evangelist. I think there's some major issues with this. There's lots of other examples of face recognition. So right now, if I wanted to find a lady with a, a red striped top with blonde hair and glasses in New York, it would take about three minutes using facial recognition to find it. They actually found a bomb near the city hall because um, it was un unused, untouched for a while. They recognised a, a terrorist because they drove past the city hall three times slowly with the same number plate. That's where it's at. A few years ago, no one wanted surveillance. Now I can't hear anyone saying they don't want surveillance or cameras in their cities. But once you plug this in, Big Brother is definitely watching us. Um, and so I call it information ecology, where we're starting to interact with cities using information technology. Here's a flippant line. The common language of binary digits talking to each other through embedded devices. Samsung is about to release no product without a Wi-Fi uh, embedded technology so that it can talk to each other. Soon that will be embedded everywhere. We'll literally change all of these vectors and operating system of our cities. I like to put this up because um, any architects in the room should be careful. Um, being a yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Being a planner, architects and planners have a little bit of a, a rap rapport, and I'm not really a keen planner. Bit of a rat bag, so it's all good. And you don't look like a you look like a rat bag architect. So <laughs> you're you're a good guy. I'm loving the beard. Um, uh, you know, architects tend to talk about urban futures when they've got no work. They write pretty pictures and keep themselves occupied. Town planners talk about urban futures when they go to conferences. They don't really get a chance to think about it. Um, I've got to the point where I'm not interested in uh, you know, being rich or wealthy. I'm interested in having a, a unique conversation and I love it, you can tell. Um, but what I, I put this up is for, because I think when, when architects and planners talk about future cities, they're really good at putting up this sort of rubbish you know, utopia, etc. My thesis and my, my suggestion to you is that the future of cities is not about the built form and the infrastructure. The, the future of cities is about the fundamental operating system of how humans interact with cities and each other in a unique way. Um, I'm yet to find a science fiction film, and you may be surprised to know that I've watched a lot of science fiction, that really grapples with these issues. I look at these and think none of them have got it right. Probably the closest, if I was to recommend, is a movie called Her. Yep, I've seen a nod. Where the guy actually gets a new operating system on his phone or his digital assistant, uploaded and falls in love with it. It's a great film. It's pretty light, but it's got some deep and heavy and uh, uh, amazing uh, bits in it. But it gives you a bit of a glimpse of what is really going to happen in the very new future. So don't sort of believe the hype around you know, all of this stuff. This stuff's important, but it's not really going to be the essence of the future of cities. Now, I'm wrapping up. Uh, good timing. Thank you. Um, now, you know, this is going to change how we work. It's going to change our home. It's going to change our work. Now, I put this up because I did a presentation to school teachers once and realised I had a chance to give them some homework. A and I don't like doing presentations and wasting your time and you going away and doing nothing differently. And so if you were to do some things, there's lots of things you can give it a go. If you're, you know, install a new app, experiment, try something different, 
with your technology. Your phone's got voice recognition. Give it a go. You'll improve your productivity. You'll improve your pronunciation. My mum, an English school teacher, will be proud of me for suggesting that. Um, but additionally, this is a quick one. If you want to write down one thing and Google it tonight or tomorrow, Corning. Who's heard of the, the, the manufacturer Corning? You've all heard of that? Corning's a global company that's done a series of videos called Corning A Day of Glass. I won't show the videos, but it actually gives you an indication here of the sorts of things that are coming and how it's going to change uh, cities in itself. So that's just uh, one suggestion. Uh, really thank you for the opportunity. As you can see, it's a glimpse into the future, but it's a future that's within our grasp and within our lifetime. And I think the key here as communities and as leaders and as planners is to actually understand what our values are so that we can shape the outcome rather than the outcome shaping us. Thanks very much.